So welcome everybody. My name is Manuel Herranz. I am CEO at a company called Pangeanic. Pangeanic was born uh, 23 years ago as a language consulting company and it has evolved over the years uh, into uh, machine learning uh, coming from uh, machine translation to general AI and of late customizing AI or Gen AI for the enterprise which is our subject uh, today and I hope you enjoy it. So I don't know how you move this to the... Okay, so uh, Pangeanic deals with natural language processing. Natural language processing is one of the branches of AI, is the branch that deals with language as you know. So I'm gonna start bottom up from basic concepts into more technical, uh, into more technical concepts later. So natural language processing involves name identity recognition, knowing where things are, what is the people, what is the bank account, what is the credit card, what is an action to extract knowledge, uh, machine translation, uh, question answering for chatbots, it's speech as well. It doesn't deal with image recognition, that will be another branch of AI, but in a natural, in a natural um, NLP is, is, is AI. And before I start, I'd like to go back, I always like to go back 120 years and mention a visionaire that used to paint what a chat GPT was gonna be in year 2000. And he, uh, he envisioned uh, a chat GPT, this is a, cartoon, a French cartoonist, Jean-Marc uh, He envisioned a machine, a future in year 2000 where students would not need to read a book because the teacher would feed all the books and all the knowledge of the world and all the Wikipedias and websites into a machine. And this machine, guess what the machine did? The machine connected to the students' brains and read the books for them and passed the knowledge onto them. Wow, this is, this is what we have from December, December 2022. Quite, uh, quite a visionary. Uh, these, these little cards were given to people in France as part of a packet of cigarettes. But we cannot escape the frame of mind and the times where we live. So it's the same person that envisaged a play at the time where data was king and we could consume knowledge this way, would envisage the future of communication, not as a digital, but as a postman delivering letters, physical letters, to uh, the places where people live, were flying, which was high, high tech, high tech uh, in those days, to people in skyscrapers. So, okay for knowledge, uh, distilling, not so much for communication. So the question here today is why, why would you custom, I mean, you're here because the title of this session is Customize an LLM. So why would you customize an LLM? What would you gain by customizing an NLLM? <laughs> <laughs> Why would you customize an LLM? Uh, yes, okay. Um, well, um, this is not me. This is the head of research at Meta, as you know, Jan LeCun, a person I really admire. And says, but autoregressive LLMs are full of Bull, you know, they hallucinate uh, off the shelf. They can tell you lies and construct things that are not real. People still believe them. Uh, they, they don't reason. They uh, just generate one word after the other, which is pretty simple. So why would you want something like this in your organization? What problems could possibly this solve? Particularly when Gardner also says that there is a lot of problems in data sharing, that if uh, that your assets, most precious assets uh, at a company, at a corporation nowadays, is your data. Data that contains your knowledge, your health and safety procedures, your interactions with clients, interactions with your own staff, uh, etc. So why would you give that to somebody? So we ran a poll among some of our clients 
asking them exactly the same question. Why would you go? Would, would, well, number one, would you want an LLM working for you? Oh, yeah, 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 this is great. Yeah, we would want uh, ChatGPT working for us. Yeah. And, but why would you want it? And the questions that, well, the, the, the statements that mostly came, um, came as replies to us, uh, number one was ownership. I want that, but I want it working for me. I don't want my organization working for somebody. Yet. I don't want my organization to work for OpenAI or Microsoft, etc. So I want my own agent. I want my own uh, pilot. And then questions about privacy, obviously, as I said, I don't want to give my data away. Brand recognition, I want my company AI, whatever the company happens to be, something that is easily to update. And then cost, which traditionally has been a very, uh, a very important point in all engineering work, came into consideration. But guess what? In 2023, most CDOs have a free bar to spend as much as they want, as long as they bring in AI systems, AI efficiencies, as we shall see in a minute. Okay, fine, we end, but that's what we did. So Panjianic has gone through a series of customizations from the very early, <clears throat> from the models that we could customize, obviously. From the Dollys to the Vicunas to the Lama 2s, Sefer, lately Sefer is, is, is great. Models are becoming smaller and smaller and every time more accessible um, and more, uh, more manageable. By the way, if you want to try a little customization that we did, you have the URL at the bottom where you can go and, and question and um, run a little um, question answering chatbot kind of service. That is the base model that we use, uh, a custom Pangeanic model um, with rack systems. So this has been more or less the state of feeling at enterprise this year. Number one, shock. Everybody was, well, Google was quite in shock. Uh, in December last year, so who was not under a state of shock in January, in December, in January, in February? So we went from shock to denial. This is not happening. You know, tell me, tell me. No, this is. I've been work. I've been in engineering for. This is not happening. This is to uh, okay. Let's grab our wallets and throw some money at it, and maybe we can come with a solution with something that mm -hmm, can fit in our organization. And then uh, wondering, uh, wonder what can we do? What can, what can we actually do with this technology? And build solutions with it. So pain points. Incredibly, after speaking to close to 100 clients of ours, um, the problem number one they came up with, or the, the keyword they came up with, was emails. Handling emails, but not just handling emails. What clients meant by emails was knowledge extraction. How do we interface with people that ask things for which we need a lot of people to reply with, with a lot of knowledge? Uh, means money, training them, uh, means that these people have to be kept up to date with development, uh, development star company. It's a huge investment. Can an LLM make this operation more efficient. So we call that knowledge extraction or knowledge dissemination. Um, privacy was always an important point there. Creating a chatbot, more or less the same thing, creating a chatbot with structured data or unstructured data with uh, retrieval augmented generation, we shall see in a minute. Uh, for some clients that are quite international, machine translation, machine, uh, machine translation quality estimation, you know, how sure I am that can, how sure can I be that I can publish this stuff without being reviewed by a human, which is increasingly happening, okay? And you put a disclaimer, and it's sometimes cheaper to say, okay, fine, there's a little error on the third line or the fourth paragraph, which doesn't bear any, any consequences to the company, and, and uh, so forth. So, now is when we start getting a little bit technical. It, this can be boring, but exciting for some other people. 
To fine tune a large language model, obviously you need data. You have to get one of the open source models that are plenty uh, available. It's not the same situation that we had in January or February. We settled initially with uh, meta products, number one, because we like meta products. Some products, not all products, but some <laughs> products we like. Number two, because we, we have a um, good relationship uh, that doesn't involve money with the engineering team. And we pass on knowledge. We, we talk to some of the engineers and, okay, they're good for us. And we test some of their models before they, they, they are released. But we use other models as well, not just Lama, uh, Lama, Lama models. And... Um, and you do the retraining. If, if you, how many people here have read the Lama, how Lama 2 was built, the, the academic the paper? Quite thick. Okay, everything is there. If there is anything that you want to know about how to train a model, step is extremely well documented. Even if you don't know anything about re building an LLM, you will learn it there. You will learn it in the 60 odd pages that, uh, that are there, all the concepts. So, this is not academic. This is Manuel speaking here. Uh, there's no paper on, on this. <clears throat> For me, there are two ways in which you can customize the use of an LLM. Uh, from the outside, exogenous, or from the inside. If you run the exogenous, the outside, you always will deal with a black box prompting. Now, you can get fairly good results with prompting, but you will never understand what is happening, and you will never own the solution. It's quick, it's hands-on, dirty, works, but you have no control on what's happening. It's always uh, second or third hand. Or you can go for the fan and do it yourself. And then get data sets that belong to you, supervised learning documents that belong to you, and start feeding all this documents and data, monolingual data, to, to the model, okay? Which we'll learn. This is not easy, this is not cheap. It's becoming cheaper and cheaper every time. Uh, but thank God there is something called LoRa, low rank adaptation, which means with that with a very small set of data, you don't need to retrain the whole model, sorry the whole model, but only a small section of it, to specialize it in exactly the tasks you want the model to do. So you want question answering, you want summarization, you want access to your data, you want, you want the model to start speaking as you, as you want it to, to do. There are several advantages on, on, on using LoRa when you retrain an LLM. By the way, you may not need to retrain an LLM after all. But if you want to do it, this is, this is the way. Uh, the presentation will be available, I think, on, on an informatic website, on our website, so you don't need to take pictures if you don't want to. Uh, um, and obviously, by doing that, so by, doing, by running a retraining once, you, you have this model that starts behaving like, uh, like, you, like you want. However, there's another way not spending so many dollars, which is called Retrieval Augmented Generation, a rack system. There is a session later on uh, that only deals with rack systems, um, and I presume you'll get a lot more data there. And basically, with uh, this vector database, what you do is ground the model to what you want the model to say. So the beauty of these databases is that you don't need to retrain the model, number one, you save some dollars there, Number two, you can easily upgrade and change the data live as you go along. So your documentation, your ISO procedures, your customer facing price list can be changing. You change them in the database. Your LLM checks with the database what is happening and then produces results on the spot. And you can change your mind three times a day. It doesn't matter. Okay? The LLM will change the, your, your answers three times a day. Um, like every system, there are advantages and disadvantages. On the left, we have knowledge graphs, knowledge, graph, knowledge graphs ground, re, uh, um, question answering systems very well because they're one, two, two. Okay, so you have a set of classes: animals, mammals, reptiles. You know, a reptile will never 
move to a mammal category. So if somebody <coughs> asks the model, how do you milk a, a lizard? Well, you can't milk a lizard because a lizard is not in the mammal category. Okay, you reduce hallucinations that way um, a lot. With vector databases, you deduce by applying vectors that lizards may not may, may not be may not produce any milk because they are reptiles. But there is a small chance of still hallucinations there. So uh, this summarizes basically what uh, what I've just explained. Your, database, your vector databases can contain a number of inputs. The inputs can be images, the inputs can be documents, can be other databases as well, okay? So you can call databases. Uh, they can be URLs, so you mix your results with the latest that has been published by, a, um, by another news agency, and this is a real case. So I mix all the knowledge of my news that I have on X conflict or X war with the latest that I've heard that this new service is producing. And then audio files if you, um, if you happen to have them tagged in a, in a, from call centers and, and recordings, et cetera. So all this data produces a vector representation. The customer query also comes with a vector representation. They match and you get an answer. Easy, isn't it? And you, you knew this. You knew this. So uh, you would get things like this. You know, I couldn't leave this. Uh, I'm a Barcelona supporter, so I couldn't leave this presentation. Which is, you will query this, and you will get an answer about Barcelona Football Club. Okay, so let's see some examples of a chatbot that we built, a uh, very quick exercise for a car manufacturer whose name I won't reveal, but is somewhat clear who it is. Um, we gathered data from their website and some of their manuals, and um, we fed a system tagged, uh, tagging the H1s and H2s of the data Assuming that H1 and H2 in an HTML file, H1 is the query, how to change the tire, how to change the oil, uh, how to change your anti-freezer, okay? And the body text is what you want to know. Okay, and okay, we got quite fairly decent results. Uh, we, in a question and answering system, um, considering that was done in one week, uh, with fairly good accuracy. About half of the replies were useful. Um, third were not useful. Okay. But um, a, large, a large amount of answers can, uh, were, were found to be useful by, by evaluators. So this proves that organizations such as yours already are sitting on large amounts of data that may not be structured but can be utilized for very quick, uh, the very quick building of question answering systems. What happens if your data is unstructured? If you have, boom, emails from, the famous emails from uh, clients. I lost my flight. I left my glasses on, I left my laptop on the flight from San Francisco to New York. Um, so this is a real case, a travel site, a European travel site that deals with anything between 18 to 20 million emails a year from people losing their flights, losing their luggages, my daughter missing the flights, I left my small poodle while I went to the toilet and then I checked out the plane, the poodle, my dog was left on. People do all sort of funny things, and they want to know a couple of things. Uh, this email is about losing, missing a flight, uh, losing luggage, leaving something on the plane, et, et cetera. Um, so then again, there was a quick exercise on, on tagging, on understanding, an exercise on name entity recognition, because for some reason, they also want to know the airport code IATA code as well as the, the acronym. So B E R, BERT is Berlin, and Berlin has a code, etc. Um, 
And initially, we found that traditional uh, naive Bayesian code performed just as good as an LLM. It, we didn't need to change the, the, the technology. But our client was coming with a lot of money because they had an order from sea level saying, this budget on AI, spend it to build future technologies. And then we understood that the real problem for them was not to classify models. They, they um, shared the news with us. The, the problem was not so much to classify the emails, but to obtain certain KPIs and, and, and metrics and information from the emails. So classification was one thing, and it was nice. If we stuck to the old model, they could never run that. They could, okay, they could classify very quickly and cheaply, but they couldn't build on more, they couldn't couldn't build on more intelligence on what what was happening on people missing flights and and, and so forth. So I'm not sure if you can see this, but okay. But these are two typical emails. This is um, quite recent, actually. We be we finished uh, the customization in November, and that's when we introduced Sephir as well. Um, as well as, as LAMA. So, okay, as I mentioned, uh, LAMA 2 13b produced results that were very close to traditional methods of classification, but CEPHIR, um, a 7 billion uh, parameter model, works uh, just as well, it's producing the goods just as well, and um, it's amazing because it runs on, on, on much smaller, much smaller uh, hardware. Okay, uh, this is what I've just mentioned, results from Spanish ISR, the Spanish tax office. Uh, I can name them. Five minutes, okay, I'll manage. Okay, uh, obviously, tax office wants to anonymize data because they deal with tax issues of people and translation. So they wanted um, an anonymization tool to deal with, uh, with the data. Uh, had to be on-prem, had to be on uh, state infrastructures. It didn't run on, on, our, on our infrastructure. And so we did. We collected data, some data that they shared. We produced an anonymizer to them. Um, and, um, and now they anonymize uh, tax, European tax issues that they have to share with law enforcement. Okay, some data here. Machine translation, quality estimation, uh, I mentioned before. This is because of, our, because of our reads, it's quite popular. So people want to understand if the material they, they, are, they are translating matches certain quality thresholds for automated publishing, no human involved. Perhaps we're not there yet, but people are pushing for it. Uh, the brand on the left, everybody knows, it's a car manufacturer. EFE, EFE, maybe you don't know, uh, is not so well known in the Anglo sphere, Anglo speaking world. EFE is the largest Spanish speaking uh, news agency and number four in the world, taking into account any language. And they produce and consume a lot of news from, from other sides. Acciona is an uh, infrastructure, and then again, the, the tax office. And basically, what they wanted to do is measure whether the translation quality of the current systems was good enough if they could automate post-editing, so have a RAC system, like I mentioned earlier, okay, to post-edit with human preferences on terminology and style, and then leave it out. Leave it out. Okay? No, no human involved. Little disclaimer, or this, this uh, documentation, this machine translation is good enough. Okay, I think I'll have to rush through this, uh, but there were results. Uh, then again, we involved Sefer. General conclusions, can we run general conclusions? There are many, many ways in which you can utilize LLMs. They can make um, corporations efficient. The road seemed practically impossible at the beginning of the year, 10 months ago, 12 months ago. It is becoming more and more uh, affordable. As I can see, there are many boots. No, not just us, there are many boots from uh, customers, customer, uh, from companies customizing LLMs, mitigating hallucinations in a better or worse place. The, the way forward I recommend, at least in December 23, maybe I change my mind in Q2 next year, is to, to implement a retrieval augmented generation, RAC systems. 
where you, um, uh, where you can privately deploy AI and make it work at your organization. And if you want a demo, that's a URL. And if you want a better demo, our booth is just uh, over there.